Hi there, you're listening to the Guitar Speak podcast produced here in Sydney, Australia. My name's Matt Wakeling and thank you so much for joining me. Now today I speak to two Canadian musicians with very different musical outputs. First up we have Tara Lightfoot who's a fantastic singer, songwriter, guitar player. Came up really through the, the folk and uh, alt country kind of scene in, in Canada but has uh, branched into more of a rock kind of output and her new album New Mistakes is fantastic. Great songwriting, she's a fantastic singer, just got an incredible tone and um, the guitar parts are just full of life and, and vibe. It was really cool to talk about that new record with her. After I speak to Tara, I speak to Steve Lips Kudlow from a veteran and uh, legendary metal band Anvil. You might remember Anvil uh, from the early 80s. You might know them from the movie This Is Anvil which tells their story. And really since that film came out in, I think it was around 2009, um, the Anvil Boys have been on the road nonstop uh, and really achieved their their dreams. So very cool to speak to, to Steve as well. But first up, here's my interview with Tara Lightfoot. We're gonna kick it off with a little sample of her tune, Pinball King from the new album, New Mistakes. Thanks for your time. You look like you're you're racing around Australia. You got the uh, the whistle stop tour. Yeah, it's pretty insane. I've already been to four or five cities. <laughs> That's great. When did you get here? Like last yeah. week or something? Yeah, last week, uh, just before Australian Music Week. Yeah, awesome. and stayed in Cronulla for a couple of days. Oh, that's a nice spot. That's a good part of Sydney. Mm-hmm. Cool. Now I saw some other Canadian artists hanging around as well. Has there been? Um, was on Oz Music Day. Was there a Canadian kind of showcase going on or something? Yeah, there was. There were there was a couple of people there. I think Twin Peaks, Dylan Menzies. Um, I'm trying to think of who else was here. I can't remember the other Canadians. Yeah, I'm but not... there were more. We we had to bail midway through that night to get to Newcastle. Oh, of course. So I didn't get to see night. everybody. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, of course, you're out here promoting, um, touring your latest album, No Mistakes. Congratulations. Fantastic. Thank you. Record. Thank so, you. Is this your second full player on Sonic Union? Uh, it's actually the third one. Oh, okay. Yes. So yes. I've got Every Time My Mind Runs Wild. That came out in 2015. Yeah. So which one am I missing? Yeah. You're not missing any of them. Okay. The first, the first record is a folk record. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just stick with what you have. It's really? You've, you've moved on? I, I hear, when, I, moved. when I hear your stuff and when I read about your career, I often read... Uh, old country and and then now we're talking roots rock now these are just labels which you know don't necessarily mean anything but is that i guess is that a it sounds like you're saying that's an obvious shift you you've made on your last couple of records just to up the up the rock a little bit oh yeah for sure um i think also the kind of the soul music and the, and the blues is really coming yeah, through yeah 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 and what cool. i'm doing especially on this record yeah great what what kind of influences um that direction well i mean not in the gospel sense but in the rock direction i'm very heavily influenced by mark Bolan and okay. t-rex yep yep cool um and i guess you know i like i like lead belly i like really old blues music mm-hmm. and i love i just saw bonnie Raitt. Oh, awesome. um i just saw her show it was amazing i think she's great i i like I like so much music, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I've been listening to other country music too, but that, even though you can't hear the influence, it's there. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. I get the impression yeah. that's that runs deep with you as well, so it's always floating around somewhere. Yeah. 
Yeah, cool. Now, um, what, what's the writing process like for you? Because you've got a killer band you've had for a long time. Do you guys jam out stuff? Are you bringing ideas? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, I, I usually write the tunes uh, and then I'll, I'll bring the idea on guitar and voice to them. Okay. And we'll kind of put it, put it through our filter. Yep. Um, I mean, a lot of the tunes on this record I obviously wrote on guitar. That yeah. made sense. A yeah, couple of them sure. I sat down at the piano, but um, I also found that it was really fun to kind of improvise um, the solos and the little guitar lines that I was doing. Okay. Yep. So we did pre-production in the studio, and we, you know, I, I had a separate room for me so that we could hear me singing. Yep. And the guys were just in front of the glass, you know, on the other side of a window, and. I would play things that I thought were ridiculous mm -hmm. at, at certain little instrumental junctures and we would listen to the, the playback and the guys would go, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Nice. And, the... <laughs> and, and I, I was in disbelief, you know, it seemed so funny that they would like what I was doing, but a lot of those things stayed on the record. That's great. That's fun. The, um, the record sounds so vibey. Are you tracking, are you tracking together as a band very much? Yeah, some of it. I mean, some some of it we we ended up doing some overdubs. Yeah. Um, but we we were all in this one big room. It's a kind of a, built like the 1970s studios, where like that one big room where the drums are. Yeah. And the bass player and the keyboard player were in there, and uh, and I was locked in another room to ISO vocals. But yeah, sure. Yeah, like the ending of Two Hearts is one of my favorite moments on the record because we we woke up in the morning and we knew that we had to do that part. Okay. Yeah. And we just, we just rock. That was the first thing that we did that day, and that's the take that we that we saved. That's awesome. I love that tune. It it kind of struck me as like a fifties doo wop, but with a very modern vibe as well, and um, some yeah great tones. What what guitar are you using on that? Because I see you pictured with an SG, and that looks like you spend a lot of time on that. But that in on that track, there's a brighter kind of twangier tone. What what's happening there? On two hearts, it is still. It's still the SG. I okay. know that's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Um, I kind of used that that guitar. I call it Veronica, uh -huh. and it's a 1972 standard. Um, and I used it on everything. So we we had a big kind of amp and guitar competition because we had a lot of instruments at our disposal, obviously. Um, so basically, what we did is we lined up all the guitars and all the amp combos. You know, guitar uh, the head and cab. And my stuff went out, so I have a 1962 uh, Fender Bassman. Uh huh. Cool. Like a a blonde, yeah, blonde Bassman, and uh, and that went out as well. So my mm -hmm. tone and what my gear, what I'm comfortable with, is what I ended up getting to play on the record because the producers were harsh. Yeah, yeah. They wanted the, <laughs> the best sound, and and that's what we used. Yeah. So, so. you you sang the SG and the Bassman. That was that was pretty much throughout the record. Yeah, and then there was a cool. 64 Deluxe that I used for some overdubs. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I also began using a, a Range Master treble booster. Oh, yeah. Which is an old a vintage pedal, yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, other than that, we just used amp overdrive. Like, I don't, I'm not really much for effects. Yeah, sure. But I love the treble booster. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, a, a treble booster into an already slightly angry amp is epic. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was heavy. And then we we use like tram, I think, on a couple. Yeah. But that was just amp amp tram. Yeah. Amp tram as well. Yep. Yep. Cool. So like lonesome eyes, yeah. this beautiful tram part on there. Yes. For example. Yes. Yeah. I love that. You, you talk about yeah. overdub stars over Dakota. That had big guitars. That's that was one track that really stuck out to me. You've obviously stuck a couple of rhythm guitars on there, which um. Sound yeah. massive. Is that the? Is that that's like, the treble booster song? Ah, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool. It's exciting. They are so alive. Those guitar parts. Love them. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, that's one of the ones that I'm talking about. The little da na 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 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I thought it was ridiculous. You know, lifted right out of a like a video game or a carnival or something, and the guy said, "Yeah, no, that's cool. Just play it." So yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Thanks.
Pinball King, I really like the, um, it's almost doubled, but it's not quite the acoustic and the electric parts together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. That one, we, we tuned that guitar way down. I think it's in C. Okay. So, yeah, the opening guitar is quite low from what I remember. Okay, cool. What's, what's yeah, the... Yeah, so the tuning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's open G, but it's in C. So it's actually, I think it's like C, A. Like, you know, it would normally be... E G D G B D. Yep, yep. Everything's down. Uh, but then, since it's since it's down, it's C A C. Yep. A C. I don't know A C C. I can't remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But just that. Open, I'm yeah. terrible at transposing tuning. <laughs> Well, I don't know about you. Do you, I, me? I just still think of it as an open G. So I just strum the whole thing and still say that's my G. But you yeah, you translate to the rest of the band. Yeah. Yeah. Get down. Yeah, that's cool. That's a cool tone. Yeah. That's great. What, yeah, Lonesome, Lonesome Eyes is an open G also. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. What, um, what acoustic are you using? Well, on the record, I was so sad that it wasn't done because somebody just built me a custom guitar. Oh, wow. Um, it's so incredible. Like, mm -hmm. it's insane. All, all my best guitar playing friends have played it, and they're all drooling. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, the one that I played on the record, I think, was a, like an older Gibson. Yeah, cool. Like a Dove or something. Yeah. I can't remember. It was one that they had at the studio. Okay. Um, I think it was like a 60s Dove. Mm -hmm. And I like those. Um, and I love the way the cellulose finish crackles. I love that. Oh, yeah. About yeah. them. Super vibrant. And the way that, it, yeah, and it sounds really warm. But yeah. so my new guitar is built by this woman called Ashley Leanne. Okay. And she's a young luthier from near where I'm from in Ontario. Okay, yep, yep. And she approached me about building me a custom guitar. And it was, I guess, probably a year before I ended up with it in my hands, but it wasn't ready to do the record. But like Daniel Lanois, do you know who Daniel Lanois is? Yeah, of course. Yeah, wonderful. So he's a good friend and he played it. Oh, and wow. he was like, I can't believe <laughs> mid-range. And it was just glued together. You know, this guitar is crazy. So yeah, oh, I wish that I had right. that one. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I... So now I'm playing that one live. Oh, great. Whenever we do, like, You Get High or something like that. Yeah, yep. That's yeah. great. Very cool. So, Very cool. Yeah. There seems to be some really cool Canadian luthiers, um, especially for acoustics that I keep hearing about um, yeah. these days. Yeah, there's tons. I also met, I, I was touring with uh, Bruce Coburn in September. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, awesome. And his luthier came out to one of the shows, and she's in Toronto. Okay. And she's built guitars for everybody. Uh, Carlos Santana. Wow. Uh, who else? Bruce Coburn. She does somebody else who's super famous. Her name's Linda Manser. Okay. Yep. But I was really into it because I'd never heard of women building guitars, really. Well, the and one. And then all of a sudden, there's two of them. Yeah. Well, the one I I most know is Meredith Coloma, and I'm not sure where she's from, but she's Canadian. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another woman, Luthie, doing you know fantastic stuff. So good to see. Good to see. Yeah. It being less of a big deal, you know, because it's not yeah. obviously. Yeah. So, um, cool. Um, yeah. So what what have you brought to Australia? So you've got your your you're, you're, you're with your band, obviously. You've brought your four piece I band am. down, which is great. Um, yes. What have you brought in terms of guitars? Well, I had a massive panic attack when I tried to get my <laughs> SG on the plane from Japan because oh, I no. I'm sponsored by Reunion Blues, yes. the, the case company. Yeah, yeah, they're great. So yeah, they make these amazing gig bags. Which means that it's a soft bag, so I can get it on the plane. So yes. I had only a slight moment of extreme panic, but <laughs> the Japanese, uh, the Japanese people were very kind to me and made sure it got on the plane to Australia. So, oh, nice. Um, so I brought, yeah, I brought that, yeah. and uh, I also brought uh, my Epiphone. It's a, a John Lennon Casino. Oh yeah, cool. And that's another one that tricks people. So. Whenever people play that guitar, they always ask what year it is, and I say 2011. Yeah, okay, so the reissue, <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, but it's the John Lennon version, and I just took the pick guard off, which doesn't matter, but yeah, sure. if you see it in pictures, you'll you'll know, maybe yeah, not be able to tell, I don't know. Yeah. So that, that's the one with the P90s, hey? Yeah, and I ha I haven't changed, the pickups are stock, so I haven't changed them, so it's, it's quite uh, a different volume level than the SG, but I have mm -hmm. a different, uh, I use a tube screamer with it, okay. TS9. Just to yeah. beef it up a little, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And what about amps? Are yeah. you relying on backline while you're here in Australia? Yeah. So I usually like to play Fender amps. So I'll get the Bassman combo, the new one, if I can. Yep. Yep. Um, 
but they haven't had that. So I've been playing actually William Crichton's Super Reverb. Oh, nice. Is, I nice. think, yeah, it's an older one, so it's it's cool. It sounds good. I like Fender amps. Yeah, cool. So you're in the you're mm-hmm. in the ballpark with the Super Reverb, I guess, even if it's not your your regular. Yeah, yeah. Very Makes cool. Me happy. I, I've, I, this is going to be a dumb question because you're just so busy and so in the moment um, with no mistakes by the looks of things. But what what does the rest of your year look like? How do you, how are you rounding out this year? Or what are you looking forward to in um, 2018? Well, this year I'm looking forward to getting through the rest of this Australian tour because it's been amazing so far. Um, yeah, I'd like to see some of the towns and some of the countryside and, and some of the different wildlife. That's what really amps me up on tour. <laughs> uh-huh. Cool. Um, but then after, after we get home, we're playing one show in Quebec and then we go to England mm-hmm. and Scotland. Um, and I really like, they have a guitar festival up there in Ullapool that I went to last year. Okay. It was really neat. Yep. And so I'm heading there again. Um, and then we play Massey Hall in Toronto, which is a big, I don't know what the version of it is in Sydney. I don't, because you guys have your big, are you in Sydney? You're yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. Yeah, we've got um, we've got like big arenas, and then we've we've got, uh, I guess the next middle thing is the, the our Horden Pavilion, which is not particularly vibey, but it's well loved and it's a big a big barn that fits yeah. all the people. And then tonight, I know you're at um, you're at Lead Belly, which is a super vibey yeah, but small smaller room, but mm-hmm. really really beautiful venue. Yeah, yeah, so... yeah. Massey Hall is like like Royal Albert or okay, or, wow, um, or the Ryman in Nashville. It's like that. Yeah, so right. I'm excited about going there and playing a full set. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't have anything big and beautiful here. We've just got sort of big boxes or football fields where we put <laughs> big bands. But um, that sounds great. That sounds super yeah. cool. Excellent. Thanks. Well, hey, Tara, thanks so much for your time. Really fun to talk about your record. And, um, yeah, I've loved it. The, again, the, uh, I haven't even talked about your vocals. We're a guitar podcast, so... Um, yeah. We, you know, we like to talk about the nerdy guitar stuff, but obviously your vocals are super um, earthy as well. So between that and, and your guitar playing and your band, it's just such a great, such a great vibe on the new record. So, yeah, congratulations, and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing more from you. Okay, cool. Thanks, Matt. All right, there's my interview with Tara Lightfoot. I totally love talking to uh, Tara about her, her new record and touring Australia um, I do love the record so it's always fun to to dig into some of the bits and pieces um, when we have these guests on and I really need to thank Jade from Revolutions Per Minute Publicity for lining that up Tara had just literally walked out of a radio interview and uh, and took my call and we we organized that so thanks thanks Jade um, really appreciate it all right, next up my conversation with Steve Lips Kudlow lead guitarist and singer from the legendary Canadian metal outfit, Anvil. Now, I mentioned the film, the documentary, This Is Anvil, that was released in 2009, and it really followed the band's uh, rise in the early 80s. They were quite an influential band uh, with an impact on other bands like Anthrax and Metallica, really, really uh, important in the speed metal scene, which was just emerging at that time and the film follows their rise and and then their struggles in keeping the band going but they did keep the band going and really since that film came out there's been a resurgence and Anvil find themselves touring and releasing albums full time. I got to catch up with Steve just a few hours really before the first show of their Australian tour of 2017 and I really appreciated his time. Just a parental shout out, uh, Steve does mention the use of certain herbal enhancements during the songwriting process so if you've got younger listeners with you you might like to uh, be aware of that all right we're going to start off with a little uh, excerpt of the classic anvil track metal on metal and then we'll move straight into the conversation Hello. Hello, is that Steve? 
It, it is Steve. Hi, Steve. It's Matt Wakeling from the Guitar Speak podcast here. How are you going? It's going good, man. Great. Hey, thank you for your time. I, I look like I'm at the end of a long day for you of press. Well, it's not. It's it's only the beginning of the day because it. I, I'm going to be on stage in about I don't know. <laughs> In about six hours, six, seven hours, so it's only just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, I should say congratulations. This is your, um, your, on the 40th anniversary of Anvil World Tour. That's, that's an incredible achievement. Oh, yeah, man. It's been, it's been absolutely incredible, the, um, the momentum that we've built. And, you know, to be... <laughs> to be retired from doing deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> when you say that, do you mean your day job? Yeah, I quit my day job 10 years ago and I haven't looked back. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's been absolutely an incredible ride. I've been to virtually every country everywhere in the world and there are Anvil fans everywhere and I'm living my ultimate dream. Oh, you know, I'm not making millions of dollars. I'm making a living, yep. which is all I ever wanted. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. And um, Anvil's journey has been very well documented. But to hear, um, yeah, I mean, 40 years of anything is, is incredible. So doing what you love and doing it on your own terms is, is a fantastic Well, that's exactly it. Doing it the way I want, when I want, how I want. Nothing could be better than that with no compromise. Never had to sell out. All on my own terms. Got to love it. Yeah. What could be better than that? Absolutely. Now, along the way, you've been, um, you and your band have been in incredibly influential. Um, I'm thinking about bands like Metallica and Anthrax and Slayer that, that have all name mentioned you. What, what does that mean to you, Steve? Okay, what was the end of that question? Oh, what does that mean to you? That, you know, there's what does it mean to me? The influence well, you've had on other musicians. Same, well, actually, it means the same thing it meant to Lemmy. I know that that sounds like a weird thing to say. Um, I sat in a hotel room in Birmingham, England, with Lemmy, uh, drinking vodka <laughs> <laughs> and, and having a big, long discussion. And I, I said to Lemmy, you know, how does it feel to be such an influence and inspiration? You, you're so unique. You're so how does it feel like, you know, like, what is it like? And he goes, don't worry about it, mate. In 10 years from now, there'll be some other bloke sitting across the table saying the same thing to you. <laughs> and he was right. And he was totally right. That's awesome. Hey, how does it feel? It's like, wow. <laughs> how cool is this? Yeah. Fantastic. I didn't think I had that much of an impact, but I guess I do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that. Ultimately, that you just do what comes natural. Mm -hmm. You're not doing it with the forethought. Oh, I'm going to teach everybody how to do this. Yeah. You're thinking, wow, I, uh, you know, look at what I created. Okay, let's hope everybody likes it. That's what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking, oh, I've done something so revolutionary. I've changed the world. Sure. You know, you never think of it in that in those terms, and you never really take it that seriously you know it for th for things that you kind of take for granted i pick up my guitar i make a, a riff up rob starts playing the drums you're not really thinking oh this is going to change the world i'm going to i'm going to influence all these musicians you're not thinking that you all you're thinking is oh that sounds cool <laughs> you know that's all you're really thinking about and having a good time yeah, you know great. That's great. Well, speaking of influences, what, what influenced yourself 40 years ago when, when you guys formed Anvil? Well, it's actually quite fascinating. You know, my, my first jam session with Rob, my, uh, my, my friend that was in my chemistry class in, in high school invited me over to a jam and Rob showed up. And we began playing, and uh, of course we're doing, you know, a song by this band, that band, but uh, mostly um, for Rob, you know, like I, I, I have a huge admiration for Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, and that kind of ilk of music, that type of stuff. 
And when we started jamming, Rob was like going, oh, wow, a guitar player that knows how to play my favorite music. Mm-hmm. You know, for so we kind of like, wow, I'm a drummer that likes, that knows how to play this. It's like, wow. <laughs> so, you know, the, the jam was going on. And then, you know, I start making up some riffs and Rob's playing along. And the other guitarist is standing there scratching his head and goes, what, what song is that? And <laughs> Rob and I look at each other. What do you mean song? We're making it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been like that for 40 years. <laughs> That's great. It's just, it's just, you know, a moment of sheer luck and destiny. And here I am all these years later. It's, it's incredible. And you don't think about it as you're doing it. It's just very natural progression that you basically take for granted. Mm-hmm. And it really wasn't until the movie that we started realizing, what do you mean? You mean everybody doesn't carry on like we do? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, you, you have released, I think your, is it, if I got this right, your 16th Anvil album. That was Anvil is Anvil. And there's another one due out early yeah, next there's, year. Yeah, there's another one that's in the can. It's coming out in January called Pounding the Pavement. Which, if you you know just as well as I do, when you're pounding the pavement, you're out there looking for work and <laughs> yeah, and making a living, and that's yeah. what we've been doing. So I think it's quite aptly titled. That's a great title. Yeah, is is the writing process the same? Are you still? Is it still down to you know you and Rob in a yeah, room jamming still, out stuff? Yeah, it's still like that. It's still like that first jam. You know, mm-hmm. like <laughs> I start riffing away, and Rob starts playing along, and he goes, "Hey, man, what about this or that? Oh, yeah, great, yeah." Away you go, you know, it's still really much the same process. You don't do too much thinking about it. You you just do a lot of creating, you know. You you don't really think about what you're doing. You, you, you just do it, you know. And it should be as simple as that. And when it's not, it's never as good, you know. You know, the song Metal on Metal, we wrote it in 10 minutes, you wow. know. And, and that's that's the essence of all of it is you have to have it inside and discover it and just let it write itself. That's the real secret, you know, if there is a secret. Mm-hmm. It's just being able to identify with the, with the sounds in your head, you know, and, and be able to just uh, let it go and let it flow without being an intimidated or inhibited, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, you could you could say that marijuana is a, a big part of it because it it lowers your resistance in the in a sense to to uh, to negativity. You kind of don't think about it. You just kind of go with the go with the flow. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I, I I shouldn't really talk about or attribute. Uh, artistic stuff to it but at the same time there is a, a a bit of truth to it and it's 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 really the release of that other world the subconscious okay yeah because i believe that all the all the the ideas come from your subconscious and when you when you release that uh whether it's by smoking or whether it's by drinking or whether it's just an inspiration of the moment, it's still the subconscious being released. Because when you consciously try to think of it, you never, you, you, you stumble and search. But when you write from your subconscious, it just flows. There's, there's nothing, nothing in the way. It just comes out. So that's, that's where you got to be when you're, when you're writing and what writing is. It's really the release of what's inside without, without thinking about it. Okay, yeah. You've, um, you're known for a high-energy guitar style. What were some of your influences as a guitar player? You've mentioned Sabbath already, so I, I imagine Tony Iommi was a huge figure for you. Uh, I, you know, initially, initially uh, to begin with, discovering the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and then eventually... Jimi Hendrix, mm-hmm. yeah, um, but even more over discovering rock and roll, uh, Elvis Presley, and and Chuck Berry, 
I think Chuck Berry was is a major influence in a certain sense. That's the guitar player, lead guitar player, vocalist, yep. front man. Mm-hmm. That's the prototype. That's the original. Yeah. And right down to the semi-hollow uh, guitar through a Fender amp. Uh, that's about as basic and fundamental and part of what I am. You know, and and what's attached to that? Well, there are many things attached to that. You've got Johnny Winter. You've got, uh, uh, well, even Jimi Hendrix himself doing Chuck Berry songs. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's, for sure. Everything is really attached to that essence. Um, one of the, the big strongholds and the big, big influence in a certain sense was Ted Nugent. Okay, yeah. And although Ted might not, might not not be everybody's uh, choice as far as a political perspective, but certainly as as an entertainer and as a lead guitar player, amazing. It, it's just wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it, and and he attributes a great deal of his of his influence to Chuck Berry as well. So uh, and and it's funny it. Uh, it, it, how overlooked it, it, it was, and it, and how it came into focus only recently when when Chuck passed away. Mm, yeah. But 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 realistically, man, he was the man. Yeah. Yeah. And only because, and I honestly say this, and only because he was black, he didn't get the fame and the acclaim that he really deserved. Like as being the almighty, the almighty prototype, but it's guys like me and guys like Ted Nugent that wave that flag and remind everybody and tell them. But that's that's the real truth, man. Mm-hmm. I've seen. Um, I don't think I've seen you either on video or in picture with a guitar other than a Gibson Flying V. Is that always been your go-to model of guitar? Well, actually, um, what 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 it was um, at the at the early days of 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 Anvil or Lips, I used a Gibson ES three thirty five. Oh, okay, okay. So again, that, that was Chuck ultim- thing, that's yeah. ultimately my favorite sounding Gibson guitar. Okay, yeah. Um, I I have other Gibson guitars. In fact. Uh, Dave Grohl gave me one because because of my appreciation for semi hollows, he gave me one of his um, one of his his signature model oh, guitars, awesome. which is yeah, cool. uh, basically uh, like Trini Lopez's uh, yes. guitar. It has yeah, the yeah. Firebird uh, headstock. Yeah, very cool. But it's like on a three thirty five body. Yeah, beautiful guitar. Mm. I love it. But it doesn't leave the house. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> You don't you don't take that out of the house. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, if you know what I mean, um, I have another uh, another amazing Gibson guitar that was given to me by Gibson um, when they gave me my endorsement, and particularly at, from the Hamburg uh, division of the Gibson uh, family, they gave me what is called a, a, a Vegas High Roller. Okay. Now, a Vegas high roller is a semi-hollow flat top. Cool. Which is, which is very related to my custom-made flying Vs. Now, what I did in the early 80s, I went to a custom guitar builder, and I had him build me a flat top flying V yep. that's semi-hollow. Cool. Yeah, I've seen the one with, with the, uh, the F-holes. Yeah, and it was a one pickup. I've, I used it up until a number, up until about uh, five, six years ago. Okay. And when I got another, when I got another endorsement, somewhat of an endorsement from a very small independent company, because when I approached Gibson, they weren't keen on it. They, they they weren't going to make me a signature model. I was my profile wasn't high enough. Well, Gibson is are a bunch of twats anyway when it comes to that. That's that's another story. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, 
even though I have a unique uh, and very individual idea, they didn't think it was going to sell, okay. I guess. Okay, sure. Or not their A&R pe- people didn't think it was that good of an idea. Uh-huh. Um, and I, w- I didn't really press the press the issue. I just accepted whatever, whatever. Okay, guys. You know, and it wasn't an exclusive endorsement, so I was open to talk to anybody I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And as it turned out, um, John uh, John Gallagher, the bass player of the band Raven, uh, got to being uh, good friends with this guy who owned a small company called October Guitars. Okay. And he approached the owner and said, "Listen, why don't you make a guitar for Lips? He's 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 got a really cool idea about making semi hollow flying V's." And the guys, the guy just perked right up. He goes, "Oh, that sounds like a great idea." So he uh, inspected my custom made one that I had made uh, from the from the early '80s. And basically, what it is, it's it's a thin line. It's it's a flying V that was uh, made uh, to be uh, the same body shape and neck joint as the 1958 uh, uh, 1958 flying V. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's the neck joins at the, at the last fret. So you've got a hundred percent full reach on the top of the neck. Cool. Very cool. So this was the, the body cut that I used as my as my uh, prototype, but what we did is we took a, a piece of mahogany and cut cut it all out, like cut the whole center of it out, and then pancaked, you know, put a, a piece of, of of maple top on the on the top and the back, with with a half cut. Uh, maple uh, support for the bridge. Oh, okay, yep, yep. So it's a completely a semi-hollow guitar uh, built to the specs of of the 335. I mean, the neck on, on it, it was like my 71 335, really skinny. Okay, um, yep. And ebony, I put, I used ebony uh, fretboard and Gibson um, Gibson fret wire. Uh, Les Paul inlays, so it's more like a 355 neck. Okay. Looks more like a 355 or Les Paul custom neck. Cool. From nice. the look of it, but mm-hmm. um, I, I didn't on my new one. There's no binding. I I just it's I like I didn't really care to have binding because in changing frets, if and when, it's way easier to get the fret job with. Out the binding there. Yeah, sure. Yes, definitely. So I went for that, mm-hmm. and uh, for instead of using uh, standard F holes, I had them uh, shaped like um, like lightning bolts. Awesome! That is very rock. Very so it's cool. really cool, and yeah. because of my influence of of Richie Blackmore, I I wanted I wanted a tremolo. Yep. So I use, uh, but I don't didn't want the in body type of tremolo with the springs in the back because I didn't want it to interfere with the aspect of it being semi-hollow. Oh, of course, so I yeah. use a Kaler system, oh, which okay. is yep. uses the same um, the same mounting uh, concept as, a, as the stock tailpiece, mm-hmm. uh, uh, stop tailpiece, like, like on a Les Paul. Oh, okay, it's so just, it's all above body. Yeah. Yeah, great. Very cool. Now your your tone is is just a classic metal tone, and and listening to your albums over the years, you've really stayed true to that. What what are you doing for amplification? Oh, I use like I like I said at the beginning as being Chuck Berry influenced. I use Fender Twins. Okay. Yep. And I have been my entire career. Oh, okay. I, cool. I I I tried I tried a Bujera. Um, they were tube damps, also with four six L six tubes, but they didn't sound very good, and they were not they were completely unreliable. Okay. So they're in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a crank twin. Are you driving them with any pedals or anything? Well, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, I use, and it's an interesting uh, in the earlier years. 
the Fender Twin, um, the reverb in and reverb out, I was using that that as the distortion uh, or overdrive of the amplifier. And in the uh, late 70s, they used to produce a, 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 a non-Fender part that was a coupler. And it would actually, it was a piece of, of, of plastic and embedded in the plastic were resistors and stuff that like a circuitry of some sort that coupled that coupled the reverb system. So it plugged into the back of the amp from the reverb in and reverb out. And you turn the reverb to 10 and now it's overdriving your amp. Okay. Oh, that's cool. That's such a great yeah, idea. Yeah, it was a really cool idea. And you could, you could use uh, just a chord, but b- because of the resistance and, and um, you, have to, you have to use something that has some kind of circuitry to tone it down a little bit because the the tube would the tubes would actually begin feeding back if you just use the cord. Okay. Like you could plug a, a male end and, and a male end and just short the two things out and it will do the same thing. Okay. But it it's almost too too high of a level and the the tubes themselves start squealing. Okay. So you can't really do that. So you have to use this particular made little circuitry. Now, I don't even know that they make this anymore. Mm-hmm. But on the first visit to Japan in 83, um, I went and bought a little tiny battery-ized, 9-volt battery-ized uh, amplifier I was going to use as a warm-up amp backstage. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, it had no sustain, no distortion. So I thought, well, let me try some of the pedals that they have here. And I tried out, I must have been 50 or 60 different pedals, and I... I, the the Boss DS1 sounded pretty good, but yeah, cool. uh, there was a, a particular Tokai pedal um, that was that they made, mm-hmm. um, and I really liked the tone of it, and it had a great um, tone sweep so that you could adjust the, the the amount of bottom end or the amount of treble on one little dial, and through the little amp, it sounded absolutely sounded killer Uh wow that's great man so i bought that distortion unit without really thinking that i was ever going to use it for anything else other than the little amp well when i got home from japan it suddenly struck me what would happen if i plugged this into the twin so i plugged it into the twin and i my jaw dropped i could not believe (laughs) what i was hearing i'm going oh my god it's like and what was really interesting is you know the, and I don't even know what you call it. I'll, I'll for, for all purposes, I'll call it proximity. When you turn down the volume on your guitar, um, with with most distortion units, it just it sounds like hell. Doesn't it? Doesn't clean up. Yeah, it sure. just sounds like it's muddy and crappy sounding. Yeah. But in this particular case, when I turned down my guitar, it went clean. Mm-hmm. I went, oh, okay, so it's like very natural. You turn the guitar up, and now it's full on, and you got your, your full-out bullocks, you know? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. you turn it down, and you can clean it up, and you don't lose a lot of volume. It's just clean. Mm-hmm. So it's like, wow, this this really works. Great. And are you, so, still, are you still using that or something similar? Yeah, and I'm still using that. And um, The same pedal? The same pedal. Wow, that is cool. And what... What what's really uh, remarkable is I've only had one breakdown, mm-hmm. and it was caused in the studio. I was we attempted plugging a microphone through the distortion for for an effect, mm-hmm. and in doing so, the the technician at the at the studio plugged in the phantom power. Oh, okay. And the, the pedal smoke. Would have fried it, yeah, with a 48 volts. So <laughs> I had to replace it, which yeah. was no problem. Yeah. But when I did replace it, I bought a few of them. Okay. And I've never had to, re- <laughs> I've only had to re- replace it once, but it was because of a stupid mistake like that. Okay. But they last forever. Very cool. So what have you brought to Australia with you? Are you using Backline at the gigs? 
Well, the thing about using Fender Twins, you can find them in every country that you go to, so it's no problem renting that. At home, I use uh, Dual Showman bottoms. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which are are fifteen JBL fifteens, um, incredible, incredible bottom. It's just like wow, you, <laughs> it, it, it shakes your balls, man. It's just like wow, it, it, amazing. Um, but generally speaking, when out of the country, when I don't have my JBLs, I, I just use uh, a straight bottom four twelve Marshall bottom. Okay, with with Celestians and. It pretty much serves the same purpose. Okay, yeah. They're not 15s, but they they got a lot of good bottom, yep. uh, and it does the job. So it's it, that, that's generally what I use. Cool, nice. Now, Anvil um, has been you know, a, f- a four-piece for much of its career, but in recent years you've been taking on all the guitar duties in your gigs. H- have you had to adjust your style or your, your tones or anything? In a well, actually, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, the, the truth is, you got to be you got you got to get better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm really I'm really really serious when yeah, I yeah. say this. When you've got a second guitar playing underneath you, you don't have to be as accurate, sure. and you don't think you're being less accurate. You 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 just don't. You're just not hearing yourself as clear as you as you think you are. Mm-hmm. When we remove the second guitar from our our mix, I'm going, oh geez, I can hear my fingers moving on the fretboard. <laughs> I never noticed that before. So you've got to be way more accurate. Yeah, you can't hear you. You shouldn't be hearing uh, finger movement on your neck. Or finger noise, but when it's masked by the second guitar, you never hear it. It's mm-hmm. only when it's removed you're going, "Oh, I didn't play that as clear as I should." You know? Yeah, sure. See, actually, it forces you to be a lot more articulate and clean about your playing. Um, as far as did it change anything, any of my performances? I. Uh, in some cases, like in songs like Forged in Fire, where it was actually a two-part rhythm, where I'd play, I'd play one part and then the other guitar would answer the, the rhythm, I had to actually <laughs> to play both parts and still sing. Well, yeah, you're, you're fronting the show as well as doing all these guitar parts. Yep. So it was actually a bit of a challenge a bit of a challenge singing and playing some some of the songs because I'm actually having to play both guitar parts where yeah. I didn't before. Okay, sure. But generally speaking, everything remained the same. Yeah. What really needed to happen, you need the right kind of bass player. Okay, yeah. That became really important. Mm-hmm. And when we removed um, the guitar player that we had the bass player that we had particularly in Dixon he was not a four piece bass player he was not a three piece bass player mm-hmm. and if you understand what i mean and that's sure. a different animal you know when you you, you you need to be a lot more a lot more um uh, rhythmatic i guess was, would be the word that uh, maybe it's a made up word but okay. you've got to be able to cover like as a bass player, you've got to be able to cover and be audible. It can't be just underneath tone. It's got to be just as audible as the guitar so that it, it holds the rhythm down mm-hmm. when I drop to lead. And it wasn't until, and this is an honest truth, it wasn't until we got Chris Robertson, the newest bass player, that we got the right guy. Okay, yeah. You know, um the bass player that we've got after Ian left, uh, the guy Glenn Five, was also really from a, a four-piece format, and it was a real challenge for him to re-adapt his bass playing to to cover for a three-piece band. He was not using, um, in my opinion, the correct kind of bass. Um, you don't use a Gibson Thunderbird bass 
in a three-piece band. It doesn't really work. They are extraordinarily bottom end, Mm -hmm. and they don't have the cut in their tone to really uh, fill in for the missing uh, rhythm guitar. Okay. Um, He left the band, um, and we got in a bass player that was uh, known for being in a, a Iron Maiden cover band. So it was a, a very uh, much more articulating bass player, but still not quite the right guy because, like uh, once again, uh, the application was to a, a four or five piece band. So he's not. He was really still not uh, the right guy. But uh, the following guy that we got, which was, ended up being Chris, is. Uh, his f- favorite music is Rush. Okay, yep. So he totally and gets that, that idea. That's the world he comes from. Yeah, cool. He's a full-on three-piece bass player. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a, a fing- he uses finger technique, but uh, it's what makes it really outstanding is it's played um, like a classical guitar okay. with fingernails. Oh, wow. So you've got a very, very hard yet finger technique tone. This is, I've never heard anything like this that completely, utterly matches the sound of our drummer. If this is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate combination, when you've got a bass player that fits with a drummer that is so incredible, uh, double bass drum player, you need somebody who can still be heard playing along with this and give those bass drums the, uh, the room in the mix mm-hmm. to be heard and the notes underneath it to fill it out. We've got the right guy, and that tone is absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I've gone out. I, you know, I start the show out on the floor and play March of the Crabs, which is a double bass drum piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In most cases, um, particularly in the past, you completely played off the bass drums Yeah, yeah. in order to keep in time. Um, and, and, and just as a recent, uh, in a recent moment, um, I went out in the, on the floor in our last tour in China, and the bass drums weren't really very loud in the mix. Uh-huh. So you couldn't really hear it. Yeah. Um, but the bass player is chopping away, and it's like, wow, <laughs> I'm playing to the bass player, not to the drummer. <laughs> well, that would have been a first. For the first time in my career, I'm going, I don't believe it. I'm actually, pl- I'm hearing the rhythm of the band from the bass player more than even the drummer. Okay. That's, that's the essence that you need. Yeah, right. Cool. But now you couple that with the aspect you need that second musician or that second player in the band who can back you up vocally. That's another instrument in itself. Chris is amazing at it. Yeah, great. This is the best that band has ever been in my, in my humble opinion, Mm -hmm. honestly, that we, I think that for the first time I actually feel the confidence. Everything's there. That's supposed to be. And all through my career, I've felt that there were th- short f- shortcomings, and I don't feel that way anymore. So I, I, not only on a business level, and and spiritual level, but on a musical level, I'm I'm at the best place I've ever been. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. That's great. So good to hear uh, things that have you know, worked out. You know, in terms of lineup, and obviously all the touring you, you guys have been doing over the last decade or so when uh, things have picked up so much. So that, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Really, really great to meet you and, and hear a bit more about your backstory and, and of course, that of Anvil as you, uh, as you celebrate 40 years with, uh, with the, the Australian leg of your world tour. Yep. I'm going to enjoy the hell out of it. Yeah, I already right. am. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, thanks so much. Hey, have a great gig tonight as well. And, uh, okay, man. All the best. Thank you very much, and then we'll hope to see you at the show. Yeah, thank you. 
All right, there's my conversation with Steve Lips Kudlo from Anvil. That was a lot of fun. I tell you, I love hearing how these early metal guys got their tones happening. Obviously, uh, multi-gain stage amplifiers and high-gain distortion pedals just weren't around then uh, for them to get these sounds they were hearing in their heads. So I love hearing him about messing around with a Fender amp and then eventually finding a Tokai distortion box, which he really loved and still uses today. That's cool. And the semi-hollow Vs, I wasn't expecting that. So that was that was a bit of a revelation as, as well. I've got to thank John from Nuclear Blast for helping see up this interview as well. So thank you so much, John. Okay, that's it for this episode of the Guitar Speak podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember, you can see us at, uh, catch us on Facebook or Instagram. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio or iHeartRadio or pretty much any podcaster these days. Just uh, stick Guitar Speak podcast in the search and you should be able to find us. All right, my name is Matt Wakeling. Thanks for joining me. We'll catch you next time. Bye now.